you can keep talking. We're waiting for the slides to switch. Yeah. Uh -oh. No, it, it, it is. Okay, I think I think they've switched. Okay, hi. So I am Josh LeBaire. I am the executive director of the Biodesign Institute, and I am welcoming you to what I believe is the fifth annual um, Arnsen Grand Challenges Lecture. I, it could be the sixth, but it's at least the fifth. And um, uh, I'm going to just spend a couple minutes just telling you about who we are, if this works. No. Can you advance? Oh, there we go. Okay, that's not the slide I'm looking for. Oh, yes, it is. I guess maybe we are supposed to ask you to sign up for our biodesign newsletter. So um, uh, if you want to scan that barcode right now with your cell phones, um, I never have a chance to get my phone out fast enough. So I told them that we should have barcodes in the room somewhere uh, in case you don't get it. But that, that, we, that way we can keep you up to date on the various presentations and and um, programs that we're doing throughout the year. So please, um, if you don't already get the newsletter, use the barcode to do that. Okay, now I'm gonna see if that moves the slide again. And it is not doing that. All right, slide please. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about the Biodesign Institute. Um, we were formed at around the turn of this century, um, kind of initially envisioned as being a sort of biotechnology institute but pretty quickly, with the arrival of Michael Crow, um, the, the scope of the Institute expanded dramatically. And our, our goal really is to solve big problems. And they can be any kind of big problem. Uh, and our approach to solving those problems is to look to nature for inspiration for how we can fix things. Um, a key to our, our program and to our Institute is that we are not organized in departments because you don't solve big problems if everybody on the team looks alike. You do much better if you have members of the team who each have different expertise and bring those different disciplines together to solve the big problem. So all of all, our, our, our institute is organized into teams and, um, and each team comprises faculty member from all over ASU. Can I get the next slide? All right. So we do three things at the Institute. Um, we illuminate threats, we mobilize teams, and we shepherd solutions. So illuminating threats really means put, shedding light on the problems that we face in, on our planet for our people, for the animals, for plants, um, for, for the earth. And understanding what those problems are enough that we, have a, we, we can see a way forward to finding a solution. Mobilizing teams is what I just told you about, which is putting together people into different centers so that, that we have faculty from all over the university working together to solve a common problem. And shepherding solutions really points to the fact that it's, it's not enough to write the paper and, and you're done. Um, just publishing a paper is not enough to make a difference in the world. You really need to see that what you do gets carried forward into some kind of action. And so we believe that it's important to follow through in what we develop and, and make sure it makes it out into the real world. All right, so if I can get the next slide. I guess there are no more slides. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then I think um, uh, it's my job now to um, hand this off to the video. So can we get these lights for the stage down and put the video up? If I had to pick a point in time for why be a scientist, I was standing in the backyard of our farm sometime in the 50s and Sputnik went over, the first satellite. And my father would point up in the dark sky and point, say, that's Sputnik. That's what the Russians are doing. You need to go to college and participate in catching up with what's happening in Russia. When I came to ASU, I was given an endowed professorship funded by Florence Ely Nelson. I plowed that money into the first studies we did of uh, vaccines produced in plants. And it, it was at a time when 
The ideas we were generating were crazy enough that it was hard to get funding from the federal government. That is, they were sort of outside the box. And uh, having support from an endowed chair at ASU gave me the flexibility to hire some people, students, to try some new ideas. And fortunately for us, it clicked. It really worked well. I was uh, taking a weekend off in Thailand. It was there for some collaborative research. Went to the, the river market where the boats come in, and I saw a woman with her baby buy a banana, peeled the banana, and gave it to the child. And I thought to myself, what can I do to re-engineer a plant so it has direct medical purpose? In talking with uh, one of the professors at Baylor, we pulled together the idea Let's produce vaccines and plants. And we jointly did the very first project on a hepatitis B vaccine. And when we tested these plants, they produced an abundant amount of the structural component that's used today in the hepatitis B vaccine. Few scientists in their career actually see something that started on the bench and goes on to have an impact that, that's tangible. And you can make a straight line connection between the two things. So it was in 2014, one of my colleagues in San Diego that we'd collaborated with called in the morning. I was sitting in the kitchen and he said, I don't know if you heard the news, but there's an Ebola outbreak. And we sent some of our ZMAP, it was this drug we jointly developed for Ebola treatment. We sent some of this to Liberia and they used it in some missionaries. We designed it here at Biodesign Institute and our collaborators in San Diego and collaborators in the U.S. Army carried it forward and tested it and it worked. That's amazing. I think everyone needs to be shocked with new ideas occasionally. Something that uh, changes your day-to-day -day thought process and, and all of a sudden, bam, that's really exciting. I had no idea that that was happening out there. So the idea of a Grand Challenge lecture series was bring in new ideas, bring in the cutting edge of science, and create the opportunity for our students faculty, everybody in biodesign to interact with this, with the ideas and with the people uh, bringing them to the forefront. I'm Charlie Arntzen. Welcome to the Arntzen Grand Challenges Lecture Series. Yeah, so we're, 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 we're very honored. Um, uh, Charlie retired a few years ago and he and his family have underwritten this uh, annual lecture series, which as, as Charlie just explained in the movie, uh, is really about challenging people with new ideas and new approaches to things. And um, uh, he has been a huge inspiration. He was the first leader of our institute, really was the one who got the whole thing started. And um, uh, Charlie's here. So do you wanna just stand up or what? So yeah, so we're very we're very uh, pleased with that. So I'm I'm gonna now just um, lead off into the the lecture today, and and mention that it, this the, the whole concept of this lecture came about because we were we were thinking a little bit. I, I I read some of you may have read the Undoing Project, so you're familiar with some of the work of uh, Kahneman and Tversky. These are two of the first people in this field of what is referred to often as game theory, and they they did research by asking people. Uh, questions where they would pose scenarios and asking them to choose between one one option and another. And what one of the things they discovered was that that and I'm going to blow this, so you're going to have to correct it when I when I do it. One of the, was that that people w would do anything to avoid losing something. So even if mathematically the choice was between taking a risk on something or getting something for sure, they would always, even if the math was the same pick the one that didn't involve the chance of losing something. Um, and, and, he, and, and this got, us, got me thinking that we don't always make rational decisions. And yet, for everything we do in biodesign, all of the goals that we have, 
It involves people making decisions to use whatever new technologies or new approaches that we bring forward. And if people mistrust science, if they don't understand what we're doing, if they can't logically weigh the benefit, then everything we do is not going to happen. We need to understand this whole concept of how people make decisions and how they understand things. And I think if anything, the pandemic really brought that home for us when we saw how many um, irrational decisions people made about their own health care without because they couldn't logically weigh what the results were. So um, as we often do, we turn to Steve Monk, who did a great job hunting out the best speaker in the country in this area. And that's who we've invited to speak today. And so I'm really pleased to in, uh, introduce Colin Kammerer, who is the Robert Kirby Professor of Behavioral Economics at Caltech. Um, he's also the TNC Chen Center. He runs the, uh, he's the leader, the chair of the TNC Chen, Chen Center for Social and Decision Neuroscience Leadership. Um, he's, um, uh, you know, um, an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a MacArthur Fellow and um, does amazing work that bridges between how people make decisions and the underlying biology that causes that. So I'll, I'll hand this off to you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Josh. Um, hopefully we can get this under control. Terrific. Thank you, especially for Charlie Arntzen um, for um, funding this series. I love doing these things. It's great that there's such an appetite for kind of public science. Uh, Caltech has a similar series called the Watson Lectures. And um, today I'm going to talk about loss aversion. And you're going to see a very wide ranging set of data, which I hope is of interest and very much in the interest in, in the style of the lectures that, uh, that the Arntzens have in mind. OK. Um, what is neuroeconomics? So I, partly I'm here tonight as an ambassador of behavioral economics, which is using psychology and other adjacent social sciences to do better economics. And neuroeconomics is the, the flavor of that in which we're using data from social and decision neuroscience. Um, so the idea is to take the best methods from social and biological sciences, um, including computational models from economics. You can think of those as algorithms that have things like utilities and Bayesian beliefs and costs of information, and then they prove some kind of prediction with varying degrees of mathematical sophistication. But, but most of those economic models are not informed at all by neurobiological processes. So our, our goal is to sort of judge them by both standards. Is this biologically actually implemented? How can we study it? Can we causally change it? And does the, the neurobiology correlate with what we think the computations are being done? Uh, um, you're going to see only a few of these today. But uh, even at our small scale in Caltech, um, we try to do a, a variety of techniques. So each of these techniques, I think, is extraordinary and great in one way. Sometimes it's cheap, uh, but it also has some limits. So we use another technique that doesn't have that limit. So it's eye tracking, skin conductance, which we can measure from sensors. Pharmacology, you'll see tonight. Lesions, you'll also see that tonight. fMRI, um, TMS, and other things that do causal manipulations and optogenetics. So you'll see about half of these tonight at various spots. And so the recipe is conceptually pretty simple. We're gonna, we have an algorithmic model. We're going to fit that to, to behavior and try to infer. Sometimes it's a trait, like somebody is more aversive to loss than, than another person. It's going to be almost like a, we call it econographic, instead of psychometrics, it's like an econometric or an econographic trait. Sometimes it changes trial by trial. Sometimes the aversion to loss will vary because we gave you a pill or because we describe things in a certain way or because there's damage in your brain. So we're going to take the numbers inferred from these models. And then in fMRI, we're going to use those as regressors and try to figure out what parts of the brain you know, have bold signal flow, which, which looks like the, the same as, as the parametric estimation from the model. We call brain behavior correlation. And I'm going to use the phrase that the brain is encoding those computations in certain regions. So what's loss aversion? It's, um, as Josh kind of previewed, I'll show you a bit more math and some graphs in a minute. But loss aversion is generally the concept that people are more averse for a loss of a certain magnitude than they are for an equal sized gain. Okay, And, and the, ma the magnitudes are often money, like in a lab experiment. Money is the easiest thing to, to use and manipulate. 
but we've, we've done it with, uh, you can try to do it with things like shocks, but then you have to find it a positive equivalent of a shock. Often it will be, um, in biological applications, it could be like reproductive fitness and resources, food, and things like that. With, with animals, you're going to see a monkey experiment tonight where you can either give them animal extra food or take some food away, and that's going to be like gain or loss in the food domain. So even though we, the default setting in talking about economics is often money, it's not just money. And, and we try to use non-money as often as possible because we think the scope is much more biologically broad. OK. Uh, and so again, tonight you're going to see fMRI, you're going to see lesions, you're going to see genetic kin, which is uh, monkeys. We're going to, I'm going to show you data in, in our group somewhat uniquely. Um, we try to connect the neuroscientifically honed principles expressed mathematically with, with things in the wild, which is large field data sets. So you're going to see data from casinos, taxes I'm going to skip, marathons you're going to see, I'm also going to skip worker labor supply. But if you were taking a course, you can see weeks and weeks of this stuff. We'll talk a little bit about stocks, and then I'll wrap up. OK, here's a very good way to start. Think about this. We're not going to do this for money. If it was a smaller group or something, or you were in the lab, we would do this for money. Um, and we also will go oftentimes when we can to foreign countries with lower high literacy and lower purchasing power, like Vietnam we've worked in. Uh, a lot of people have worked in China. And we'll do this for, um, we've also worked in West Africa. We'll do this for money amounts which are much larger in local purchasing power, right? So we can pay them. It would be as if we could do it for you with you for $500 instead of 50 or 5 or 10. OK, who's going to take this gamble where you could win 15 or lose 10? We're going to suppress probability, although that's very interesting too. And a lot of behavioral and economics is interested in judgments of likelihood. But for this paradigm, we're just going to say each one is equally likely, 50-50. That's easy for people to understand, including animals and children. Uh, who is going to take this gamble? You could win 15 or lose 10. Who is not going to take this gamble? OK, so it's a majority, substantial majority of takers. Um, at this gamble reflects a loss aversion ratio of 1.5. What that means is I need to give you 150% of the loss amount to get you to take that gain loss bundle. So the ratio of 15 and minus 10 is 1 and 1.5. That's, that's what we call the loss aversion coefficient. We often use the Greek letter lambda. You're going to see that a few times tonight. And 1.5 is a pretty typical number. Um, you, so you're a little bit less loss averse or more loss tolerant than the average populations. But as you'll see, you're going to see a lot of data, almost all the data in, in the world, except for another study that's not finished, but from ours. And so your loss aversion is not too far off of what we see in typical populations and some special populations. OK. Uh, and just to remind you again, since um, in economics, we use the concept of risk to not just mean like financial variation, the way you might think about risky stocks or beta for risky stocks, if you know something about investment. But risk just means um, variation in some outcome. And it could also connote you know, something that you dislike doing unless you're paid to do it. That's the essence of how we think about financial markets. So this is just a few reminders. Getting a traffic ticket is a, potentially a risk. Um, this is a picture of uh, Mad Men creator, actor. He's, the creator of Mad Men uh, said actor John Hamm was a risky choice. That meant you know, they, they weren't sure how good he would do, which also had economic consequences. But he wasn't thinking about money risk. He was thinking about something like you know, professional risk or editorial risk. And um, back in 2008, there was a lot of debate about whether Paul Ryan has a risky choice. This is just a slide to remind you that we think of risk in an extremely general way, even though in the lab we're usually doing something much more um, mild. This is an extremely famous picture from Tversky and Kahneman, who Josh mentioned. Their, their paper published in 1979 was a kind of instant masterpiece. A few years ago at a festschrift for Kahneman, somebody asked him, did you know your paper was going to be a big hit? And he said, Yes, 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 we knew. We knew. He was very immodest. Part of it was they had presented a lot. Um, and they, you know, they knew they, they were on something pretty novel, and they were just very carefully pinned down. It was extremely beautiful. It's just a masterpiece of scientific writing, as well as unleashing a really big idea. And so from their data, what you, what you see is um, that if you think about the amounts x you could win or, or lose, like plus 15 is up here, let's say, minus 10 is here, right? This is called a utility function, and it's thought to be 
a kind of implicit function. People often don't, couldn't draw it for you. But if you give them a set of choices like plus 15 minus 10, plus 17 minus 10, plus 8 minus 10, if we give you a bunch of choices and we try to fit that statistically, um, you would get a curve that looks like this. And it could vary with different people. And what you see is what's called diminishing margin utility, which means it goes down slightly. So if you win the 15th dollar after winning 14 is not quite as good as the first dollar after winning zero. And the loss part is a little bit convex, which has the opposite um, pattern, um, a, a positive second derivative, which means if you go from a loss of 100 to a loss of minus 99, that incremental reduction isn't as good as going from minus 1 to 0, which is great, right? Which is like zeroes out your losses. So this is concave. That's convex. If you fit these functions to a power law, you get something like a coefficient of 0.88. And the, the, here, the loss aversion coefficient estimated by Tversky and Kahneman in, um, I think this one is from 92, is 2.25. We think that's a little bit too high. And your number was probably like 1.43 or something like that. So this, there's not a universal constant like pi or, or e, right? It's something that we expect to vary with, with developmental life cycle, with brain damage, with a bunch of things we'll talk about. OK. so. Um, uh, last year, we published this meta-analysis. Um, meta-analysis, if you don't know what that is, I guess it's, it's common in medicine and many fields. I think it's extremely important. It's a little bit underdone in, in, psych, in social sciences, so we've been kind of championing it in economics particularly. What that means is if you have a very common type of study, like somebody has estimated lambda in an experiment, and somebody tried to estimate it from looking at lobbying for trade group job loss, and somebody else tried to estimate it from um, uh, whether you, you, you spread fertilizer or, or pesticides to reduce your crop yield variability. You know, you, lots of people have tried to estimate this, this number, the ratio of loss to gain. And so we collected hundreds of studies. It's a huge pain in the neck. Um, if you're lucky, you, you get to be the boss who gets a grant, and I boss everyone around, and then it, you get to um, talk about this. <laughs> and then, and uh, and they're home in their pajamas watching Netflix while I'm getting all the, all the credit for their hard work. Okay. Um, so this is the meta-analysis. This is the probability density or the, you know, the distribution of all the different lambda values. So each study is contributing often one, but sometimes three or four different lambda values. And um, what you see is that the median is 1.69. The median divides them into the high and low, just in the middle. The mean, which is adding them all up and dividing by the number of studies, is 1.97. So there's a little bit of positive skewness. Um, and when we asked a bunch of people at the Experimental Economics Society, what do you think this number would be? They gave us a number like 1.3. Uh, so one thing that you often confront in meta-analysis is, did you really learn something people didn't know? And this is how you find out, is you ask people what do you think the number is, and then you figure out the number. And it would have been OK if, you know, if we got the same number they did, because nobody had really assembled this data set. But the fact they were a little bit off was kind of encouraging. You know, we, we, we now, from this graph, and now you, join an elite club of only a few hundred or a thousand people who read this paper carefully. Most of those people probably forgot what it said anyway. So maybe the club is even more elite than I thought. So you now know more about this numerical aversion to loss. And if you look at the number in uh, different types of experiments, there's a conceit in economics in some areas that, that whatever you learn from undergraduates doing things for a few dollars in the lab is not necessarily representative of other people. But if you try to extract this loss aversion number from field experiments, like you, you did something online with a group of people, or you did something at Facebook, and you involved gain and loss, the field experiments, the coefficient is, compared to the overall number, it's even higher. So it's about 0.5 higher than the average. So it's simply not the case that lab experiments are giving us a misleading picture. Usually they're giving us a first order approximation. It's enough to, it's like a, enough to keep going and to then look in the field for things like that. Oops. Um, OK, uh, this is a similar example to what we just did. Uh, Sabrina Tom and colleagues uh, and Russ Poldrack, if you're a neuroscientist, you might know his name. Sorry, I always have a Stroop problem with these clickers. Um, he asked people, uh, they, Sabrina, they, she, and they asked people a whole bunch of these gambles that you saw, these circle gambles. 
you could win 12, which is on the left half of the circle, or lose 14. This one, you could win 30 or lose 7. And if we give you a whole bunch of these, varying the gains and the losses in the right way, we can kind of learn what your lambda is. And that's what they did, OK? And uh, then what they did was they, they regressed um, uh, brain activity from fMRI. So people were looking at these gambles and saying yes or no. And so we look at brain activity at the time that you're looking at the example. And, and we try to see, is there an area of the brain that that's, has more activity when the gain's bigger and has more activity when the loss is smaller? So going from 9 to 10 is a little positive increment. Going from minus 10 to minus 9 is also a positive increment. And what you see is these pictures here. There's a lot of activity in different brain regions. But more importantly, we would like to um, see if we can connect the neural loss aversion with behavioral loss aversion. So from that matrix I showed you of the different, we estimate a lambda for each person. For you, for you as a group, it was about 1.43. For Kahneman's group, it was 2.25. And so that's on the, the y-axis is the behavioral loss aversion. We actually take the log because you remember it was a little bit supposedly skewed. So if you have a skewed distribution, you can compress it and make it more Gaussian with log. So that's what we did. If you correlate the behavioral loss aversion with uh, neural loss aversion, which is the difference in how, in how much the brain activity responds to a change in loss relative to a change in gain, you get a really high, nice, healthy correlation of 0.85. So the, the, if you would, another way to think of it is if you looked at the brain activity, and I didn't know what choices you had made. And I had to say, what would the brain guess about your lambda number based on what you actually picked? We would be quite accurate. So this is a brain behavior correlation. OK. Um, uh, here's another study that's actually older, where they looked at gain-loss region differences in the brain. Very similar pattern. The important part is the top is um, what you see uh, when you regress the size of the gain. This is a beautiful, very nice lateralized picture of activity in ventral striatum, and part of basal ganglia, which is very reliably activated by lots of different types of rewards. Almost any positive reward you can think of has been studied. Um, attractive faces, money, juice, uh, humor, it turns out, you know, humor, normal humor, like car New Yorker cartoon humor, activates this part of the brain as if, the, as if humor is money-like. It's what we call the common currency hypothesis. Um, and this study is beautiful, too, because on the left is one cohort of 42 people. The, the other is 24 second cohort. That's like a replication sample. We sometimes call it internal replication. And in 2007, that was very rarely done because it's a lot of money and time and effort. So the fact that in these two separate groups, you see almost the same picture is really, really nice. That's not the case of all neuroscience, although neuroscience is catching up and doing much better at this sense of like, if you do the same exact thing, do you get the same answer? I hope so, right? So long as you don't, and then we learn, you try to figure out what the puzzle is. The bottom panel shows um, differential activity in response to loss. And unlike the, what I showed you before, in this case, the losses are encoded not particularly in ventral striatum, but in amygdala and in temporal pole. So this suggests there's what, what we call like a dissociation, that losses and gains may be both encoded in certain regions. That's what the previous study showed us. But in addition, there's some dissociation. Loss and gain are being like thought of and computed differently. OK, um, we mentioned the amygdala there. This is an area that people sometimes, you know, in popular neuroscience, people know a little bit about amygdala and dopamine. Um, <laughs> Fortunately, amygdala hasn't been as widely memed and distorted as amygdala, maybe someday. Um, anyway, amygdala is a small almond-shaped region which is thought to be involved in a combination of sort of salience and maybe especially threat. Like if I show you a fearful face for 150 milliseconds and then I replace it by a neutral face, like a fearful face, neutral, there's the Edvard Munch painting the scream is shown here in black and white to give you an idea of a fearful face. If I show you that for 150 milliseconds and I ask people, Did you, what was the emotion you saw on the face? Not the one that's on the screen, but before that. People say, I don't know, I, I, I barely saw it. There was just a flicker. But the amygdala saw it. So the amygdala activity will tell us they saw a fearful face. Okay. 
so one thing we wanted, might want to know is, if you had damaged the amygdala, if we removed amygdala, would your fear go away? So my colleague Ralph Adops has studied uh, two patients. One particularly is known as patient SM. They're known for medical privacy by initials. Uh, and another is patient AP. And I could tell you a lot of interesting stories about SM, but she, she has a lot of abnormal reactions involving fear and threat and things like that. So what, what Benedetto Domartino and, and I did with Ralph was to ask SM and AP when they were at Caltech, how did they feel about gambles where they could gain or lose money? And if, if you think about it, do you think we'll have normal reactions to loss, like normal loss aversion, or different? Like, either one is sort of interesting. We, we thought based on amygdala research, if amygdala is sort of encoding potential loss and you have damage to that region, you're not getting this like warning sign like, uh-oh, uh-oh, you don't want to lose, you don't want to lose. Um, and uh, what happens is basically that. This paper was published in PNAS. Here's Benedetto who worked on it and Ralph. This is the location of damage to um, amygdala. Uh, this is just, we'll, we'll never have seen these before. The little black area that's kind of canceled out is where there's calcification of amygdala. It's bilateral. When you work with these lesion patients, you would like it to be both sides of the amygdala right, so that you don't have this compensation from left to right, and you would like it to be only the amygdala, like focal lesions. With animals, we can often lesion surgically and get rid of exactly what we want or, or do it with neurotoxins. And with humans, we just hope, you know, let nature take its toll, um, and, and we do scanning and trying to see where the damage is. These are two patients that have bilateral, highly focal damage. And when you ask them what kind of gambles they want to take, Um, SM says, remember, most of you would have been willing to take, um, I think, about plus 14 and minus 10. SM is like a gambling fool. She said, you know, I'm willing to lose 10. You only have to pay me 750. So her loss aversion lambda is less than 1. It's less than 1. It's 0.75. We think of that as loss tolerant. It's not that she actually likes losses, but she's willing to put up with substantial loss to gain less. That's a, that's a big difference. Her, the, the gain that she's demanding there is about half as much as we started with. And patient AP is a little less of a gambler, but she's close to loss neutral. And we compared SM and AP with people of similar age, similar education, same gender. Those are called healthy controls or neurotypicals um, because that may vary in the population, right? It may be that for people their age and education, they don't have, you know, they're in the meta-analysis somewhere on the, um, the tail. And when you do that, the healthy controls looked similar to you all, and more like the typical results. You had to pay them, entice them with a gain of 16.4. So this suggests if you'd have no amygdala, you're not afraid of losing. And, um, again, it's only, a two, the interesting thing about lesion research is only two patients, but because these types of patients are so rare, I mean, we would collect a lot more if we could, the referees cannot say, you need to triple your sample size. They, they, they could say it, but it's kind of understood that we just can't, like, we can either learn from these two people or ignore it. And the, the history of lesion research has been that the, the profession is pretty sensibly enthusiastic about learning from tiny samples, if that's all you can get, if that's all you can get. Especially if, if, it, if it corroborates, is corroborated by other types of data, right? So our interest in the amygdala came from the 2007 study and from other things Ralph had done. And, and then we went and studied loss aversion. Okay. Um, okay, here's some kin. So these are capuchin monkeys. Uh, my friend uh, Lori Santos and Keith Chen uh, worked on this. Lori now is a professor at Yale, really brilliant scientist. She teaches the most popular course at Yale on happiness, which is pretty different than where she started, which was to study primates. Um, but she's very talented, um, a really, really terrific scientist. Um, I, for, for, I wish I had gotten her picture in Keith's. Anyway, they did some really neat experiments where they trained kabuchin monkeys. You can see one here. Um, they're, they're not, the picture I've shown you shows two lab techs, one with a red coat and one with the blue coat, and then the monkey in the middle in the cage. So they're not, they're not posing to look as adorable as possible, but they're pretty adorable uh, when you see them in the, in, in the lab or elsewhere. And what happened was, 
the red experimenter would offer two. So the monkeys were trained to pick up a yellow token. Uh, it's a little hard to see them. They're here. So the monkeys would reach in, pick up a yellow token, and they would hand it to one of the two experimenters. You can think of this as like two stores, right? The red seller with the red coat um, would, would hold out their hand. They'd have two pieces of food. And the monkey trades the token, and the red seller takes one away and gives one. So when we think what's going on is there's a reference point of two, and they're losing a piece of food from that two, reference point of two. The animal research is much trickier than with humans, right? Because we can't really instruct them verbally. You know, you have to just hope that they understand what's going on, and then you get some kind of regular pattern. But we think that the, what's in the hand acts as a kind of point of reference. And if you take some away, they encode that as a loss of food. And the other um, seller, the blue seller, had, their, their hand only has one. And if the monkey extends the token, they put one extra in. It's like, for you, my friend, good customer, I'm going to add one more. right? Um, and it turns out, if the monkeys didn't just cared about how much food they got, they're going to get one. Um, ha sorry, half the time, they're going to get one. They're going to get a bonus half the time. They're going to get it food taken away half the time. If they cared about what they get, and their brains are being like really calculating, like Mr. Spock, they would think, half the time I get one, half the time I get two. I don't care whether I lost one or gained one. Like, that's, you know, that's consequentially irrelevant. But if their brains are like ours, and they perceive these reference points differently, they would prefer to buy from the blue seller, who sometimes gains them one, than the red seller, who like takes one away. And in fact, that's what happens. So 71% of the monkeys prefer to trade with the blue seller. And if you infer the lambda coefficient, which takes a little bit of math uh, that Keith Chen can do, you get a lambda of 2.7. So again, it's sort of an order magnitude of the numbers we're seeing from like 1.4 to 2.25 to 2.27. OK. Um, now, there is some professional skepticism about loss aversion in important or collective decisions. So for example, this is a quote um, from Morgan Stanley. John Mack, who was a famous executive there, said in a deposition, one of the critical criteria I use in judging my traders is their ability to take a loss. If they can't take a loss, they can't trade. Now, first of all, I don't think John Mack actually measured this the way we do, number one. Number two, it's a little bit perilous, right? Because, for example, if you hire patient SM to trade for you, she can definitely take a loss, <laughs> right? And she's going to lose you a lot of money. So when you say, I, I want you, you know, can you take a lot, can you, if you lose a lot of money for a firm, is that okay with you? Is that going to keep you up at night? No. You're hired, right? <laughs> Sam Bankman Freed, come this way. Um, so, so I think it's interesting to think about this quote and what it really means. But what I really like would be to have data on traders. And it, it, it may well be that what he means is a lot of traders, um, would be very upset, even if it's not their money, um, because this loss aversion is very viscerally, you know, their amygdala is going to go active no matter what. And if you can somehow immunize yourself against that, that um, pain, much like a boxer gets used to being punched in the face, we were actually talking about this at dinner, <laughs> dinner last night, um, if you can get used to being punched in the face or kicked in the face, uh, that will help you be a better boxer, better kickboxer. Not, and it's not that you like getting kicked in the face. It's that you can, uh, you know, you can accept it. Accept it. Okay, uh, so here, here's an example that addresses this question of when people are actually gambling for money, like traders that work for John Mack, what happens? This is a beautiful paper by Jamie Lian. So she had data from a casino, Riverbed Casino. And what happens is people have these little membership cards you know, like frequent gambler cards. In Las Vegas, everyone has them and so on. And so when they go in to, to gamble, they swipe. And the card keeps track of everything you do. You know, when you leave, you swipe out. And so the casino knows all the transactions you've made. So one of the nice things is they can say, how did, the, how did people, what, what, how did much had people won or lost at the end of the night when they leave compared to when they started? And so the net winnings have a gigantic spike that's slightly negative, right? And so most of the data are a loss of about zero to minus $50.
and there's a there's you know if you if you integrate under this curve and compute the mean, almost the average person is losing money, right? This, the house has an advantage in this riverboat gambling. Um, and and if you look in her data, what happens is if people win, they get it's sometimes said they gamble with the house's money. It's like, well, even if I lose, I'll end up with zero. Like it's not my money. You know, it is your money. <laughs> it is your money, right? But it doesn't feel like a loss in the same way as taking money out of their pocket. That's a hypothesis. And so if, 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 they, if they start to win, they keep betting until they get to zero. If they start to lose, they keep betting until they get to zero. Except if they start to lose and they've lost 200, they keep losing, they keep losing, they keep losing. So this is, again, kind of doubling down, doubling down, doubling down. And so what you, what's hard to see in the data, I have to guide you, is the data is truncated here at net winnings of plus or minus $1,000. These are kind of modest stakes riverboat casinos. It's not big, you know, Las Vegas, James Bond playing Baccarat in Monte Carlo. And so um, there's actually a, a, a big spike of people who lost more than $1,000. So most of the data is negative, near zero, or very high losses. The main thing, the point is that it's very close to zero, as if people really, really like to try to get back and break even. But statistically, it's hard to do. So they, they end up either getting near zero like, well, I wish, I, I'm behind by 300. If I can get back to minus 100, I'll quit. And some of them are able to do that. Others end up way behind, and they, they have to quit um, for other reasons. OK, this is another beautiful field data set from, uh, not from me, from um, Alan at Al. It turns out, has anyone run a marathon or walked? OK, it's two. Very good for you. My wife um, did one. And um, I have not. Uh, but marathon runners, it turns out, in big marathons like Chicago, Boston, LA, um, love to keep track of their times. So it's very easy to get data on finishing times. And not only that, I think now they have chips and so on. In the old days, probably stopwatches. But you can also find out how fast they went throughout the entire race, which is 26 plus miles. And um, this is a story about how reference points, loss gain works in a slightly different way, but we think psychologically very similar. So a lot of times for goals uh, and negotiation and bargaining, round numbers are a natural reference point for some reason. And so suppose that people who are fast runners say, I want to run a four hour uh, marathon. 401 would be kind of a loss. You know, I, like I'm a minute slow compared to 359. Right? So if you're loss averse in not reaching your goal, falling short here is considered a mental loss. We're going to see a couple more cases like this. If falling short is like a mental loss, then um, what you would expect to see is there'd be a big drop in the number of people who finish in four hours or slightly less. In this case, it's 100, what? Number of finishers in thousands. 100,000 people in this giant data set ran a four hour marathon or 359. And only 60,000 ran in 401. This is 10 million runners, right? And you see this dip. There's a drop between running at a round number like three hours and running a little bit slower, 301, 3, 331, 401. And you, you see it just as much for the elite runners. Look at these three-hour runners, right? The world record is around two hours. The three-hour runners, there's 20,000 who finish in three hours or slightly less. And there's about 25% fewer that were one minute slower. And the amazing thing is, this is an elite sample of human beings who are running absolutely as quickly as they can for 26 miles, right? And it's like, I'm on track for three hours. I better speed up. So I don't want to run 301. I'm going to speed up to get to three hours. How do you speed up when you're running at this pace? They're running like five minute miles, one after the other. And in the graph on the right, you see the same thing. This is the percentage of runners speeding up in the last two kilometers. So based on their pace in the first 40 kilometers. So the, the runners who have been running at like a four hour pace, right? And there's a little bit behind, right? They're, they're, you know, their pace is on to, to finish in 403, right? A third of them run faster in the last two kilometers. How do you run four, 26 miles? You run 24 as fast as you can, you run faster. Like, I don't, I don't know how this could be done over and over, right? So I, I think of this as showing you 
the, the intensity and the importance of this reference point achievement. Normally, I, if, if I didn't know where these data came from, I would say, this is fake, right? A bunch of people ran 301, and somebody agreed to report it in three hours so they could brag, right? But they're carefully recorded electronically and so on. Um, anyway, the point is that, is that these reference points are highly motivating, even among a very elite set of people for whom you would think 231, 230, 229, like you can be proud of yourself no matter what, right? You're one of the fastest chunks of people on the entire planet. But they're able to speed up. And if you estimate the lambda values associated with these speed ups for two of these um, groups, it's 1.77 and 2.35. So it's, again, it's not, a, it's not E or pi, but it's remarkably similar across a pretty broad range of species um, fast marathon runners, you know, these are not the same people. They're, they're quite different in lots and lots of ways. Okay, let me move to the end. Um, let me, um, I'm going to skip this one to save time, but um, I'll tell you a story related to it. This has some neuroscience. Actually, let me tell you a story as we go along. So um, in, in behavioral finance, there's a concept called the disposition effect, which says if stocks have gone up and you made money, you should often hold on to them because if you sell, you have to pay taxes. And they may keep going, right? They may have positive momentum. If, if you bought a stock and it loses, you shouldn't sell, or rather, you should, you should sell. You shouldn't not sell because you can take a tax write-off now. Um, and in addition, it may continue to go down further. So if stocks have positive order correlation, which they do, but it's very, very small, you, shouldn't, you, should, you should hang on to the winners and sell the losers. Behaviorally, people often do the opposite. So we did a little experiment where we engineered artificial stock price patterns that actually had some momentum in them. Like if the stock had been going up, it was more likely to go up. If it had been going down, it's more likely to go down. And what we see is when people sold the winners, there was an additional um, activity in the brain in ventral medial PFC associated with a kind of hedonic utility from actually selling the winner. So as an economist, if you bought a stock at 50 and it goes up to 100, you should be happy about that because you have a paper gain. And, the, and if stocks are random walks where they have momentum, most of the hedonic should be from the, when it's announced that it went up. If you sell it, you shouldn't have any extra announcement, right? Because the accounting gain should be telling your brain everything it needs to know. But what you're seeing in these data is the act of selling it and like cashing in is um, actually generating brain activity too. Uh, this happened to me at this house at 28 uh, Upsell Street in, in Mount Airy, Philadelphia, a few years ago in the late 90s. Uh, I bought the house. It was a little bit of a slump, and I wanted to sell it and move. And I talked to a real estate agent who said, um, well, you know, let's say I bought the house for 85K, and I was only be able to sell it for 78. She said, that's really a bad idea because you'll lose money in your house. And I said, that's okay. The 85,000 is a sunk cost. I, I, you know, I'm not going to make more money if I hold it for 85K. I'm just going to sit in my, house, in my house for two years waiting for the market to come to me. And it has opportunity costs. And she's like, I don't know what this is the fancy stuff is you're talking about. She, she wasn't an uneducated person. She had a real estate license. And so she knew a lot about taxes and this and that. She just wasn't thinking like a behavioral economist. And she said, you really don't want to sell your house at a loss. And I said, I want to sell my house at the highest possible price. She goes, OK, good. But if you do, you'll get a loss. I said, well, that's OK. Like, the 85 is a sunk cost. It doesn't, she goes, you'll be upset. I said, look at my face. Am I upset? Right? I'm, a, I'm only upset that you're just defying my wishes as a client. And she said, I don't think you understand. You know, I've been in real estate for 14 years. People don't like to sell their houses at a loss. And I said, I don't think you understand. I'm a Wharton professor of behavioral economics. I don't mind personally selling my house at a loss. And we had this stalemate where each of us thought the other was a total idiot. Right? And to this day, she may be somewhere giving a talk to real estate investors saying, don't let your client sell at a loss at that idiot you know, camera at Wharton. Right? He's, probably, he's probably talking right now about how much you regret selling that at a loss. I am not. But this sunk cost fallacy is another thing that plays into the disposition effect in housing trades. And there's some nice studies in this that, um, that in, in downturns, people dislike selling their house at a loss. A lot of these things in the field are more complicated because you have liquidity constraint. Um, you know, whether you can get a mortgage and stuff like that. So 
whenever we go inside the simple lab, the, the things that happen in the field are more complicated. OK, we're almost done. Uh, a couple more things. So, so um, are there ways to reduce loss aversion, either temporarily or maybe therapeutically? I'm not going to answer about therapeutically a little bit. But we've seen one effect already, which is amygdala damage. Reduces loss aversion a lot from like 1 and a half to, um, to 0.75 or to 1. Another is pharmacology. Uh, let me just tell you this one, then we'll skip over the details. Um, it turns out Liz Phelps, the yeah, third is emotional regulation. Liz Phelps and I, who's a Harvard professor uh, with Peter Sokol Hessner, um, we did an experiment on loss aversion where um, we uh, gave people beta blockers. Um, I forget the medical name, some of you will know. This is a, a substance that's used to um, kind of, like musicians who have stage fright will often take it. It kind of stabilizes emotions. Um, if you're a shooter at the Olympics, you might take this because it, it stabilizes your motor activity, right? And um, in fact, this shooter, Kim Jong-soo, was stripped of Olympic medals because you're, if you're drug tested for beta blockers in this sport, uh, they can take your medals away. And um, we studied emotional regulation. So this is the propranolol. I'll just skate through these slides very quickly. It reduces loss aversion by about 0.15. Um, Emotional regulation refers to the category of activities where people deliberately either up or down regulate their emotions. This is a really interesting category. It's very relevant to clinical practice and cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, and this is Jenna Fisher, who used to be Pam on The Office. Um, does she have good cards or bad? Can't tell. Who thinks good? Who thinks bad? Some people think bad. Who, who really can't tell? Yeah, really can't tell. It's kind of like the right answer in the sense that she's a pretty good poker player, even though you know she's not highly trained. She came from entertainment, but celebrity po celebrity poker, online poker is a big deal, or televised poker. So she's pretty good. And so if you're a celebrity, you get to be on the show. And here she has Ace Q, which is very good. So this is a poker canonical poker face, right? She has much better cards than you might guess from her face, and that's what part of what makes her a good poker player. Here's, here's uh, upregulation. So if you have negative emotions, uh, upregulation might look like this. There's two women at the end of a beauty pageant. One of them wins and one loses. See if you can tell who wins and who loses. Do you think the one on the right with a big smile lost or won? She lost. And she, she's exhibiting almost surely what is called a um, an artificial smile. There's something called a Duchenne smile, which is that certain facial muscles, if you smile genuinely, there's certain facial muscles. You could, if you were trained, you could might detect it in the face. Like if you were a contestant in the beauty pageants, you might be able to tell. And then there's something that's like a fake forced smile. So here the loser is emotionally upregulating, like, oh, I'm so happy for you. If we measured amygdala, insula, brain activity, SCR, different story. OK. And so what Liz and I did with Peter Sokol Hester was we told people to, they were, were going to take financial gambles like the ones we started out with, plus 15, minus 10. But we told them to think like a trader. You take risks with money every day. Imagine it's your job. Uh, you've done this for a long time. All, all that matters is you come out on top in the end. That's what we call broad bracketing. Like a loss here or there won't matter. So like you could like add the losses in with some gains and you know, kind of think about the portfolio. And then we wanted to see if this emotional regulation would reduce loss aversion based on what people actually chose. These are NYU students. They're not actual traders. And we measured skin conductance response. Basically what happens is the amygdala is responsive to loss minus um, gain. And very much like one of the studies we saw earlier from Poldrack, the, the behavioral loss aversion, this is log loss aversion when you're just attending, which means you're not regulating, you're just deciding what to pick. It, the, the betas from activity in the amygdala are, um, the difference between the loss and win betas are associated with this log attend. So this is a kind of replication in amygdala of some examples we saw before, right? Again, if you have amygdala damage, you're not going to see this. But with normal, these are neurotypical uh, NYU community students. Oops. So you see an important role for amygdala. Uh, skin conductance shows a similar point of view, the sweat in your finger, which is associated with arousal. Um, like if you, you know, if you dislike loss more than gain, you'll have more skin conductive response to loss 
minus gain, and that is also correlated with lambda. Okay. Uh, final part, um, reference points as goals. We've already seen some of this from the marathon runners, right? Um, here's a quote that's so delicious, thanks to John Cochran. So a common view is that if you perceive yourself as having achieved some state of consumption or win, or, or having suddenly you have in mind a three-hour marathon is your reference point. And so if you run 301, you feel like I, I lost. Right, the reference point can be this like a figure of your imagination. John Cochran quoted this um, person as saying, well, this is a paper of his where he's interested in consumption habits, what we call the hedonic treadmill. Like you compare how much I'm getting today from what I got, what I got used to. And if it's the same, I don't really feel that great about it. That's the intuition. The, the quote is, we all develop habits of consumption that would be super painful to change. A hedge fund manager's wife once said at a cocktail party, I'd sooner die than fly commercial again, right? It's like, fly commercial, die. Yeah, <laughs> you can flip a coin between the two. They're kind of the same, right? I mean, she's being hyperbolic, maybe, right, maybe. But the point is, if you're used to a certain lifestyle, going back to coach feels like death, according to this person. Um, OK, maybe it's a tax the rich advertisement. Um, here's an example, Anna Vith in the 2018 Olympic Super G, she was 15 out of 26 skiers. As you can see, she halfway through, 15 out of 26, 11 skiers left. She runs 0.1 seconds, 0.1 seconds, not 10 seconds, 0.1 seconds, faster than T. Verrethe. So she's in first place as the 15th of 26 skiers. Mentally, what is she thinking? She's thinking, I have a chance at a gold medal. And not only that, the way the skiers are organized, I think she, she knew who the next 11 were, and none of them were really great champions. So in her brain, she's won the medal. In the world, she's got to wait for 11 more skiers. You can kind of figure out where this is going. Esther Ledica, who is a snowboard gold medalist, wait, did I say snowboard gold medalist? Yes, she was a snowboarder who thought, man, I'll try, try my hand at skiing. Kind of the same, kind of not. <laughs> Right? She was a snowboarder going medals. She skis 25th out of 26. So here's poor Anna. She's seen 10 skiers go, like none of them close to her. She's two skiers away from her, her gold medal, or like keeping her gold medal. Here comes Esther Latica. She, the, the, the film is really fun to watch if you, if you like this kind of thing. And she's, she's skiing wildly out of control. Uh, last year, I tore my ligaments at Mammoth Mountain. And this is very similar to a picture of me, an AI, <laughs> like an AI reenactment. Um, I didn't even know how many ligaments he had, so I tore the MCL. Never heard of that one. LCL. What about the ACL and PCL? Yeah, I strained those two. There's so, like so many ligaments. Who knew? Anyway, it looks like me. And so Esther Letica, it turns out, skis 0.01 seconds faster. The, it's the minimal number on the scoreboard. And this is poor uh, Anna Vith when she sees the scoreboard for the first time. Right? You can, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if we have like brain activity right during this? Shh. And and then she goes over and like hides her face. I don't know if she's going to vomit or cry or just get away from the cameras looking at her. So she was very sad. And later in an interview, she said, "Of course, it would be nice if I got to the finish line and immediately knew that I only won silver." So what, this is a way of saying, when I was standing there and I had my great ski, I thought I had the gold medal, and it was like taken away from me. So if I knew at that point I only had a silver, it would have been okay. Like it's not the medal I ended up with; it was the, the roller coaster that was so upsetting. Okay. Um, final thoughts. Uh, I know there's some terrific evolutionary psychologists here. Uh, we have none at Caltech. I mean, where there's amateurs who. Um, know what evolution is, and we study directed evolution, like somebody on your preview, so beautiful. Um, but we haven't invested in that area. Uh, but um, we don't really have a firm grip on why would this loss and gain differentiation uh, be, be naturally selected for, and why would it be in the amygdala, so that if you have amygdala damage, blah, blah, blah. I, you know, we really don't know. There's a few theoretical stories, but there's not really a good story. But I think an interesting conjecture is a lot of human behavior can be divided into approach and avoid. And, and so 
it might be good to have a distinction that says, is it a gain I should move toward, or is it something I should move away from? So if you think of that as like a fundamental building block, and then that's going to give you some differences, except for this idea of a goal as a reference point. So it would be like a, approach a value goal, you know, move away, et cetera, et cetera. And here's a um, uh, illustration of that process in action. Approach, approach on the left, avoid. Baby is approaching. Whoa, he's got his little amygdala face. Here's a gorilla on the right. Approach. Whoa, I think this water's too cold. Avoid. Okay. Um, I wish we dug in more into the, the, the deeper neurobiological basis, or, or evolutionarily biological basis, but we just don't know much about that. So a recap: loss aversion seems to be around 1.5 to 2. You see that in a lot of meta-analysis, the best meta-analysis done so far by our group. You see it in the capuchins. Um, 2.7, a little higher marathons. Uh, this is a, um, a smartphone app to, designed by uh, Rob Rutledge, who is a Caltech student now at Yale. And when he does these things on a smartphone app, which is a really broad you know, group in the population, uh, he gets a number like 1.43. So there's, a, there's an interesting healthy range, but we also know something about the exceptions like brain damage and amygdala and um, pharmacology and things like that. So what did we learn? We learned about loss aversion, all these things, and we learned that it's reduced uh, by a number of um, manipulations or damage. And thanks to a lot of people who have sponsored very adventurously uh, and innovatively, although we're not number one, like ASU, um, <laughs> this type of research. Thank you. Some questions. Do we have any questions? So in, in Parkinson's disease, amygdala damage is invariable. It always occurs. Always. But always. Oh, really? And when you give a, do a Parkinson's patient a little bit of dopamine, they often get a side effect called... They gamble. Oh, no, they gamble. Yeah, yeah. Many different things. They have hypersexuality, computers, shopping. Exactly. Like, Eldo, like the... Um, right. Robert De Niro movie, yeah. And we've always been thinking about, not no, but this is an impulse control. They gamble like crazy. They lose fortunes. Yeah, they lose yeah. family fortunes. And we always think about that what we're doing is we're priming the reward system. But now what I'm thinking that we are lowering their the worry about losses. And so they can just keep going and keep yeah, yeah. going and keep going. And maybe, do you think that maybe we should focus on that part? Yeah, that's fascinating. I didn't know about the amygdala effect. That, that's always. A, that goes, you know, right next to the, the two, we have two patients, and you have <laughs> hundreds of Parkinson's patients or thousands. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a super interesting insight. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, yeah, and so it may be what happens is you're actually, you know, you're kind of adding fuel to the flame. So you remove the amygdala fear of loss, and then you're somehow ramping up DA in a way that generates gain-seeking with no inhibition from loss-seeking because of the system association. So maybe you need to somehow generate loss fear in some additional way. Yeah, that's, um, I, I, I'm going to email you later uh, also because of this idea that if you treat with L-DOPA, you get uh, a lot of intense compulsive gambling. The number I've heard is like 17%. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's really, it's really interesting. I mean, it partly shows you how difficult it can be to treat disorders, right? Because you have this, you know, if the disease inhibits amygdala or disables a normal amygdala reaction, you're really kind of like um, asking for trouble. But at least maybe now we have a better concept of, of why, that, why that happens. Uh, Bob, nice to see you, by the way. I've written about loss aversion. I had somebody write to me with an example, a field example, that makes your case. He lives in a country with a lot of beaches. And he says, during the summer, there are uh, ice cream vendors who go with coolers with ice cream and sell their wares there. And they always would say, ice cream coming. I'm uh, coming with ice cream. And one guy changed it. And now they've all swept into his uh, cry instead. Here's what he says. I'm leaving, oh. 
I'm going. Oh, I like that. All right. Last chance for ice cream. And he wins the day. That is great. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll put that in this talk next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of um, uh, obviously framing, which means describing the same thing in ways that that shift salience and attention, is a is a big deal. That's sort of the you know loss aversion isn't very interesting without framing, you know, um, as a more general you know kind of principle, and it's the source of a lot of nudges and attempts to do light touch behavioral change. Thanks for that. So the talk today, thank you, by the way, uh, was all about like individual decision making. And I'm wondering if you've thought at all about collective decision making. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of revolutions where we have good evidence in political science that it's not the level, but the trend that determines whether society is going to have stability or instability. And I wonder if you had any thoughts about how that might tie in with what we know about the brain. Um, that's, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one thing we know almost nothing about from this type of study is like group decision making. Like if there's a group, um, does the group become more loss averse because of some like contagious fear? Or it could be there's diffusion of responsibility. So if we lose, I kind of blame you and the group becomes more collectively risk taking. Um, I would love to just see a lot more studies with that, especially with sensorized things. You know, you don't have to have scan three brains, but it'd be nice to know something about the, the biological markers. Um, I've, 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 I have a long ago memory of this idea of like a J-curve revolution, where if a, if a society is doing badly and then starts to improve a little bit, people get impatient. You know, at a little bit of a little bit of improvement makes makes them set a reference point like up here. So even though things are actually better than they've ever been, they're not getting better fast enough. And that that often precipitates um, turmoil. And that's, again, a very reference point. You know, the, the role of this, the reference point there is artificial too. And it could easily be amplified or moved around by media, especially modern social media. And um, you could imagine um, if you wanted to create a revolution or tamp down a revolution, you know, you would be working hard to, to from that is essentially what we might call expectations management. Yeah. Thank you for your, oh. thank you for your talk. Um, my name is John Canugus. So I'd like to ask the following question. I'm curious to know what the impact of, um, to know the impact of TBIs and chronic stress on loss aversion. Okay. Traumatic brain injuries and chronic stress on loss aversion. Um, TBI, I don't know very much about. Um, um, there's mixed evidence that stress makes people more risk averse. Um, a lot of, one reason loss aversion is important is historically economists and a lot of practitioners have thought about distaste for variability as what we would call risk aversion. So it's essentially a utility function that's concave but it doesn't have like a kink at the reference point, mathematically speaking. And um, so when I say stress seems to increase aversion to risk, I don't know if there's any studies in which you separate aversion to risk in the sense of curvature from aversion to loss, right? It may be that what stress is really doing is making you unusually sensitive to loss, not to variability. It's a, sort of a mathematical point, but it's also neurobiological in terms of the underlying neuromechanism again, because we see so much evidence for this dissociation, it could be that stress is, is, is making people more loss averse. Um, it hasn't been, it, um, uh, when I say it hasn't been done very much, that some of these ideas and methods have been exported to areas of clinical practice and clinical psychiatry and public health. And there may be a bunch of literature on this. So when I, when I say it's, I don't, I, don't, I don't know, it doesn't mean nobody else knows. It's a really interesting question, it's the same with TBI. Uh, thanks again, Colin. It's on. Okay. In this group decision making, has this uh, process ever been applied to jury trials? Why there sometimes are hung juries and you can't get people to come together? I was thinking of individual jurors wanting to get done and get home and something like that. Is there a reward that way or a risk of making a decision? I'm just curious whether it's 
ever been applied to that group of people? Um, uh, I don't think so. There's a, there's a healthy literature on um, law and psychology, in which indeed, in which, in which jury decision making is kind of one of the workhorse questions. And it raises also these questions about polarization and is there a minority effect where two jurors can sway people toward them? Um, you know, this, this famous 12 angry men where one juror, you know, sort of wears down the others. And, but I don't know if that's famous because it's so rare or it's famous because it's an exemplar of something. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think a fair amount is known about this, this mathematical psychology. Um, I don't, I haven't seen, again, you know, I don't read the psychology and law journals, but um, I don't know that law subversion has, has surfaced in some interesting way there. But um, most, the answer to most of these questions is, that's a great research project. I wish somebody would do it. And it's either the top of my list or the bottom of my list, which unfortunately, which is very long, or it should be at the top of somebody else's list. Can we have one? I didn't mean to put you on the phone. Um, thank you. I, I know we're running out of time, but um, uh, the use case that I'm thinking of is the uh, advent of autonomous driving, where um, the argument is made that the um, that the radar and lasers can provide for a safer uh, commuti uh, commute, and uh, how individuals who um, put the risk on, to themselves about driving themselves, <clears throat> and how that logic would apply in terms of uh, the acceptance of uh, autonomous driving for the general public? Um, I don't have a, a lot to say. It's a very interesting question, obviously, and super topical. Um, I think there, there is something that may be relevant to risk perception more generally, not necessarily to loss aversion as a biological phenomenon. So it looks like most of the evidence is going to turn out to be autonomous vehicles are much safer. but an autonomous vehicle running somebody over is somehow more morally repugnant. Um, and legally, who do you blame? Like the software designer, right? Um, do you, you know, is there no culpable party? You know, it, it, it partly is a question about how the legal system, the same with, with AI, right? How the legal system responds to substantial technological change um, and how we as a, as a society, and different countries in different regions may even have different views. You know whether we publish, uh, pu whether we punish autonomous vehicles in the same way, and who, in the causal chain, which human or which organization is even responsible? Um, uh, and I, I, I haven't been following the the things, but it seems to me there's an interesting paradox arising that the the actual safety might be very good, but that's not going to stop there being an uproar when there's a, the first the first children are run over. I mean, it's one thing if, it's one thing if Tesla's light on fire, like, well, yeah, you know. Um, but there are other things you can think of as much more morally unpleasant. Yeah. I'm so Peter. happy I'm not the last question. That would be a big risk. Uh, so um, I'm sitting here thinking that a sizable fraction of this audience are university faculty. And university faculty has a strange win-loss system where uh, if you have tenure, you basically can't lose. You can't lose your job, so you should be able to take risks. But the way we select people for tenure is we have an enormous risk, which is if you don't make it to tenure, you're fired. And so it's a, it's a, it's a dichotomy to see how does this initial selection system produce successful people at, ten, at the tenure stage. Um, Con Danny Kahneman and Dan Lavallo, a collaborator of mine, have a paper on um, organizational decision making. And they talk about how people are often highly optimistic, but also very afraid of loss. And the last sentence in the paper, I, I hope I'm remembering it almost perfectly, is there must be a better way to manage than to pit one mistake against another mistake. <laughs> right? And, and the tenure system, I think, has a little bit of feeling of that, that, that um, not getting tenure feels like a loss. But again, it depends a lot on expectation management, right? So with junior faculty, we, you know, we try to, every step of the way, give them an idea of, if you're not on the right track, what do you need to do? Um, and um, it, it does seem like, like the tenure system may select for people who are not too loss averse, or it may select for people who are extremely optimistic. 
you know, and neither of those are necessarily what you would want the tenure faculty to end up, to end up having. Um, so I don't know. That, I mean, one thing, great thing about ASU I really enjoy learning about in my meeting, I know we have to stop, is um, it's really good to have a, in political science, there's an idea of a um, policy lab, like states or policy labs, or certain countries like Singapore is more of a policy lab, very deliberate. And it's great to have a universities in which um, you can do experiments, perhaps on the tenure system. <laughs> um, or at least you can experiment with organizational boundaries and creation of new institutes and so on. So I, um, uh, I don't know if the, uh, hardly any universities other than where, where states are really hostile to higher education are, are going to actually experiment with, with restructuring the nature of the tenure system. It, it feels to me like something that's not ideally designed for modern times, but I'm not sure what would replace it. And, and be as good in incentivizing what we want to incentivize. Okay, so one truly last question. Uh, I wanted to ask how uh, sensitive those lambdas are with respect to the levels of the gains and losses, because for me, I'd expect uh, my loss aversion would be different if we were talking about hundreds or millions of dollars, for instance. Um, you know, to be honest, even in this meta-analysis, I don't think we, um, uh, we, I think we do have a couple of graphs, which I didn't show you about that. But mostly it has to do with, with in the lab, the stakes are usually in the order of $10, $20, $50. And we have data from like game shows, um, deal or no deal. There's some data on um, the price is right. And when you study those models, you get similar levels of loss aversion. And maybe the loss aversion is even higher. You know, like think, think about, um, gambling for in the tens of thousands of dollars you might really really dislike like the deal or no deal the, the prizes range from like half a million dollars to small amounts and so if you if you estimate a reference point of where people are um you get you get really big evidence of loss aversion and that's a case where where also people in an audience the, if you know the deal or no deal the people the audience is yelling like keep going there's sort of an audience pressure to keep gambling which would be manifested as low loss aversion in, in a model. So, you know, uh, a final story I guess I can tell about last year. You know what? You might know from the Sam Bankman Fried story that came out that uh, Tyler Cowen, a really brilliant economist, asked him, how, how committed are you to like utilitarianism and risk neutrality? So Bank, Bankman Fried was like, I'm an expected value calculator at all levels, which means the utility function is just a straight line, right? No loss aversion, no risk aversion. And apparently Tyler said to him, if you could flip a coin, and there's a 50% chance the world would be destroyed, or a 50% chance the utilities would be doubled somehow, would you do it? And Bankman Free said yes. So that's loss neutrality of an aberrant kind. <laughs> <laughs> or I think so. You should read Michael Lewis's book and the other uh, recent book and judge for yourself. OK, uh, thank you. That was fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we're about to wrap up. Um, I, I have one last slide. This is just to remind you of the date for next year, November 14th. Please mark it down in your calendars. Um, uh, we're going to have, it's going to be the 20th anniversary of biodesign, so it'll be a bit more festive. We'll be outdoors, I think, maybe. And, um, uh, and we'll have Carolyn Bertozzi. So um, I'm going to hand this off to Elizabeth Munkel, who is going to tell you about some other things. Thank you. As Josh said, my name is Elizabeth Munkel, and I have the great pleasure of working with the Biodesign Institute on behalf of the ASU Foundation. So events like the Ernst and Grand Challenges lecture are made possible through philanthropy. I'd like to thank Dr. Arnson and his family again for their vision and investment, which makes this lecture possible. Philanthropic support drives so much that happens at Biodesign. And we would love for you to join us in making this work possible. One way to accomplish this is to join our Pioneer Circle. The Pioneer Circle is comprised of science enthusiasts, curious knowledge seekers, and committed philanthropic supporters who invest in Biodesign's groundbreaking research. Several members of our Pioneer Circle are here tonight. So thank you for your support of Biodesign. You too can join the Pioneer Circle with a gift of $1,000 or more. 
Philanthropy plays a unique and vital role in our work by allowing our researchers to explore new and untested frontiers of disease detection, drug therapy, and sustainable materials. To learn more or to join, please contact me. You will also receive an email after tonight's event inviting you to come and tour Biodesign in the coming weeks. We hope you will come and see the great work taking place at the Biodesign Institute. And now, what you've all been waiting for, the winners of our drawing. Drum roll, please. Hang on, I have it on my phone. And I apologize if I mess up your name. Harsha Hakal. All right, you get a mug. Curtis Leba. Awesome. And Michael Ramiti. Thank you for coming, and we look forward to seeing you next year.